Hello, I'm Robin and welcome to the November edition of Molten Music Monthly. I don't know about you, but I've had a cold now for what seems like years and so my voice is not at its best but we're going to struggle on through as I try to bring you the latest and most awesome little bits of music technology synthesis and modular that's happened over the last month. So I'll try not to waffle, <laughs> that doesn't seem very likely but hey let's get stuck in. Synclavia returns from the dead. And so does Sheer Electronics with abounding enthusiasm. Nobula is making chords. Korg goes deep. Pittsburgh goes fishing. Cosmotronic has another go at a mixer. Steady Stead Fate makes the Steady State Gate. Kodamo reveal a rather dull looking synth. Uh, a doyo physically models with polyphony. My Vault does flashing lights almost as well as I do. Audio Modern wants to mix those loops. Waldorf brings a tired old string synth onto your computer. Moog re-releases the Model D again. Sequential makes another synth. ALM upgrades Pam's workout. Sonicware puts lo-fi samples into the same old box. Cherry Audio takes on the icon of icons. Expert Sleepers does a bit of everything. Instruo mixes with superpowers. Korg ups the collection. Apollo View generates all the waveforms. And I'll have the latest news on the very, very exciting Synth East. But first, the Molten Motion Meter. We had a fabulous time last month and I'd just like to reach out and thank all of you for the, the fabulous encouragement and response we got to my little to my little module. It's just been awesome. <laughs> it's been fantastic. I mean, you know, we knew it was a half decent idea, but the response has just been overwhelmingly uh, good and, and positive, and I'm enormously grateful for all of the lovely comments and all of the all of the people who have bought the module and I've seen it about on Instagram and stuff. It's just it's the most exciting thing I think it feels awesome to have been through this journey to get to this point of having a, a, a thing I've got one here having a thing that, that that flashes and makes lights and seems to have a purpose it does things I, I also like to thank Ben Divkid for his incredible video on it I mean you know I use it for a couple of things <laughs> a couple of obvious things like visualizing modulation a little bit of mixing but he he's he has this ability to to look into the soul of a module and pull out things that you never would have thought of never would have thought of and that's that's his gift it's it's totally he's a completely unique modular youtuber in that respect there's nothing and no one quite like him so I really appreciate the video that he did on it. It was enlightening and illuminating, which is exactly what it's all about. Uh, thanks also to everyone who came out to to watch me try to put one together in the live stream of the kit. That was similarly exciting and interesting, although I was suffering a bit with uh, with the old cold. But it was a good thing. It was a good thing to do. Good thing to do. So thanks for coming along to that. And I hope that's going to be useful for other people building the kit. But honestly, the kit is really straightforward. Really straightforward and fun and exciting. There should be more stock out there very, very soon, I believe. For FACO are putting out all the stops to make sure we get stuff back in to, uh, to the shops and stuff. So if you missed out on the first batch, then there should be another batch along very soon. But just thanks. That, that's been brilliant. It's been a brilliant experience and I hope to do some more at some point. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, there's a video in the channel. It's like a module, right? It visualizes stuff. It's great. Molten motion meter. Synclavia, right? That's, that's one of those old huge type keyboards. When I was massively into synths as a, as a kid, there was this particular program that was on television which just went through everything. I, I recorded it onto video and watched it over and over again. It featured uh, the Fairlight, it featured uh, the DX7, it fe featured early sequencing, it featured sampling and bits and pieces in its most, you know, it, in its basic uh, sense. I had Bog Moog on there doing his sweepy, sweepy sounds. It was fantastic. 
And one of the devices I had on there was the Synclavio. And I was massively into sampling in these in these early days. I wanted a fair light more than anything. And the Synclavio seemed to also be that kind of thing. There was people putting in drums. They were taking drums off a David Bowie record and then using it somewhere else. And you know, mind blown type 1980s craziness. So the Synclavio to me has is, is always represented this huge sampler even though it wasn't really that it was more of a wavetable thing i think well you know i don't actually know <laughs> who knows who ever got a chance to use one that's the question now what i did get to use was the the table in which you put the the keyboard and bits and pieces for the synclavia oddly because that was in a studio that i was fitting a computer in many years ago and that was quite Anyway, by the by, Synclavia apparently are back and they've got a new thing and it's not a big enormous keyboard workstation. It's a slightly strange, uh, interesting looking desktop thing with weird curves and, and stuff. And what is that about? Well, it's called Regen and it has a fabulous front panel uh, with a screen and these interestingly Tron-esque buttons and bits and pieces on it. It's really going for a, sort of a, a futuristic vibe in terms of the physicality. But it's, it's a digital synthesizer. It's going to be pulling in subtractive synthesis as well as wavetable and sample-based stuff. I, I mean, I think basically the idea is you're squeezing everything. It's, it's an FM synthesizer, it's an additive synthesizer. They're pulled in elements of subtractive and sample-based waveform generation. You can mix all the waveforms together, use t up to 12 partials, and it supports all the latest type of expression uh, control, MPE, uh, velocity sensitivity, and all those sorts of things that perhaps the original ones lacked. It comes with a huge load of sample content and presets and bits and pieces, and I think the idea is that this is aimed very much at the sound designer, someone who wants to, to take and manipulate every form of synthesis, cross and move between them to produce the most amazing sounds that no one's ever heard before. I mean, it's looking great. Apparently they forgot to put MIDI on it. Well, <laughs> you know, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? But apparently the uh, the production line ones will have. They're open to pre-orders, cost about two grand, and is oh, when it's really quite interesting. It has a it has a different flavour, has a different vibe. Obviously, it has all this history behind itself to bring along to the game. But ultimately, it's going to be about whether that interface really works as something that you can design sound on and get to grips with the complexity of the multiple sound engines and layers of stuff that you've got inside. But, you know, exciting times. Something else that's quite exciting is that the Sheer Electronics Relic is back. This is bonkers. I can't, I, I'm quite beside myself that, that Jacob, Jacob is was this five-year-old toddler who had a dream to uh, to build an Oberheim clone, to to clone the Oberheim, and over the years, you know, through his teenage years, he was soldering things together until finally, at the age of, I can't remember, sixteen or something, he hit Nam like five years ago uh, with this bizarre-looking piece of hardware, and he was talking, spurting at, at high speed, all about the intricacies of the circuitry and the authenticity of component matching and, and PCBs and everything else. And this was before uh, Behringer had got anywhere near their stride on producing clones of everything. Oh, I wonder what happened to them. Hmm. Anyway, and so back in this NAM, I think it was 2017, it was, it was very, very exciting to think that someone was producing an Oberheim OBX clone uh, to the, the level and the standard that this kid seemed to be doing. I mean, it was at NAM with his mum, you know, <laughs> talking, talking to all these old long beardy uh, synth enthusiasts about, uh, about Oberheims. It was kind of a bit bizarre. And everyone went, well, that's great. And he wasn't even in the main part of the show. He was sort of squirreled away somewhere else where people stumbled upon him on the last day. So it was just uh, just interesting. And then a year later, he turned up again with more development. And everything was coming uh, coming along. And this was kind of the point at which Behringer says, we're going to clone everything in the world and give it to you for a fiver. And that, I mean, I don't know, but my perception from sitting viewing these sorts of things is that kind of just took the wind out of it and uh, Shio Electronics although the website remained unchanged for a, a few years uh, talking about what they were doing um, they just seemed to fall away and my absolute assumption was that well I mean it, it's hard to produce a, an Oberheim clone when you have someone like Behringer who's going to do it and undercut you by several thousand pounds 
So it seemed reasonable to expect that he would just sort of knock it on the head and go off and like go back to school or, or something. But no, no, what's happened is, is that he, he, he may be at school, who knows? I mean, he's a little bit older now, but he's been continuing to work on it and he's back and he was at some show or other. What show was it? I was at Synthplex uh, 22 with a brand new prototype that had been completely reworked and he was as enthusiastic and on the ball as ever. He just went, this is all this stuff, it's fantastic. And he's amazing. I just, I'm stunned by this guy. He evidently knows the technology inside and out. He's still wanting to produce this fantastic clone uh, of an OBX. He's, he's pushed the boundaries. He's created a new interface. His, the interface, I think, is, is, is probably the, the most important thing a, about it. Because, you know, one can produce a synthesizer, but he's looking at trying to do something interesting and different. Something with uh, an ergonomic and... Um, futuristic type of interface which is going to allow you to do more and take it further perhaps than the original synth intended and it's certainly true that you're going to need a unique angle because not only do we have Behringer apparently still still alive doing things uh, we also have Oberheim doing their own thing as well and so you've got to compete with the original as well as the reimagined original by the original company and the clones from the cloning company so, I mean, it's tough out there, I should think, but there's no doubting his enthusiasm and passion for this project, and it still remains fascinating. And I, I really look forward to, to seeing what occurs. Does it actually ever get to market as a thing that people can use? Because that I think that would be really interesting. Now, one of the secret modules I saw at Synthfest was from Nobula, and it is the Chord Pilot. This is, essentially, it's a MIDI controller built into a module. The idea is that it generates chords and it pairs up perfectly with the Polycinematic, which is one of their other modules, which is a polyphonic synthesizer voice within Eurorack, which, you know, you, you play it via MIDI or you can feed it triggers to trigger various chords within it. These two pair together, so you've now got this chord pilot into which you can program a bunch of chords, which you can then throw at this or other things within your rack or outside your rack because it's MIDI, ultimately. And it will do straightforward chords, or it will do arpeggios, or it will do strumming, so dring type, type chords. It's a great, useful thing, particularly if you're trying to uh, you know, to bring heavier paddy sounds uh, or hits into your Eurorack. It's perfect for that. You've got eight buttons at the top, each of which can have a chord, and you just hit those in it. And it does the thing, either manually or over CV, uh, I think. It can rotate through chords like a step sequencer, so you can stick in a, an, an eight chord chord progression, choosing from storing over like 192 chords or something, pull all those out, stick up a bank of eight, and and go through it. For me, certainly my Eurorack tends to be very much monophonic and, and I'm happy with that and I like that. But I also like the idea of, of having some control over some chordal textures. I've used a Polycinematic live uh, a couple of times uh, just for, for hitting little stabs and it can be really good. Really, 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 really interesting. But I'd like to develop more of that and I felt I was a little bit hampered by not having a MIDI controller attached to it. But in using the chord pilot with it, I can now start sending more interesting chord progressions to the Polycinematic and that I think could create this, this paddle backdrop. Paddle? I don't know. To, to what I'm doing, particularly in transitions, because you know, you've got a load of stuff bubbling away, bubbling away. Then it'd be nice to have these, these warm pads come in as you then change and move to something else. I think, I think there's a lot of potential there for, for transitional, but also uh, beefing stuff up and bringing in a little bit more synth to your modulus situation. Korg has gone all a bit limited edition on the mini log. It's their four voice analog synthesizer. What they did is that they they put it in an interesting sort of artistically and, and deep swirly kind of case and then gave it red and black keys, right? And then charge you an extra 200 quid. It's the same. It's the same as the original mini log, except that it just has a little bit of a limited edition paint job, which is cool. I mean, if you like your, if you like your synths on the limited edition side, then there's something there, there for you. 
it was it was just quite interesting in the marketing that they were saying things like oh you know people get scared or or anxious about those those white and black piano keys and so if we color them differently say say black and red they're somehow more inviting they're they're less fearful and they can approach it anew which i thought was i mean a stretch stretch of marketing materials just beyond uh, beyond anything i'd I've really come across before. But hey, it's a limited edition Korg Minilog bass. Because bass is dark and bass is black and red. And it has, well, it does have, to be fair, it has a whole bunch of new sounds from some bass type people uh, who have sound design or programmed these for you. So a whole extra bass patch of basses. So that's pretty, that's pretty great. That's pretty great. One for the collectors, I think, or people who are particularly bass orientated and don't like silver maybe. Uh, Pittsburgh are continuing their safari theme with weird and wonderful modules. This time, well I would say they're fish based, but they're not. There's one which is, there's the koi, the koi carp type fish thing, which is beautiful fish that sit around in ponds, in gardens. But this particular koi is a buffered splitter. So you put things in, it splits it and sends it back out again without any loss of voltage. That's nice. The other one is called the Okapi, and this this is not a fish. It's some kind of weird giraffe. So, you know, you couldn't probably get further away from a fish if you tried, unless you were a real giraffe, because then you'd be then you'd be higher. But these are a couple of mixers. One is a four-channel stereo mixer, the other is two plus two summing mixer. What's the difference? Oh, I don't know. You can have a look and, and see for yourself. One of them's got panning, I think, and the other one's got some other thing going on. But they're, they're mixers, and this is Pittsburgh Modular continuing this, this idea of, of animal-influenced modules, which seems to continually be working towards something. These are always limited edition. There's only usually about 100 available of each. And this seems to be the theme, and they've been doing it now for quite a while. And it does make you wonder what it is they're going for, what, what it is that's going to happen at the end of these uh, experiments and these are interesting little modules that just that just disappear before you get a chance to get one interesting i mean i'm dying to know what it is they, they're going to come up with in the future and i hope that it's soon i really like the cosmics the cosmics mixer from cosmotronic it was a cool little six channel mixer you know it was a good size good features i liked its ability to to boost a bit and saturate it had a, an auxiliary send. I would have liked to have seen it to have two things like that. But anyway, they have a new one, the Cosmix Pro. And this is a good looking little mixer. Again, six channels, but this time it does have two auxiliaries and it has these really nice mute switches, which are not switches, they're buttons. So they're, you can just, you can tap them clickless and gorgeous. It has little LED metering alongside each channel, which I think is really nice. And also on the master outputs. Uh, the six channels give you four mono and two uh, stereo. You've also got some CV control over the panning. And they have lots of plans for expansion modules, which is good because the one thing it lost from the original is it had a saturation, kind of an overdrive circuit built in, which I thought was a really, really nice feature. And that's been taken out, but I think that's going to become available as an expander over time. But anyway, it's a good looking module, which I imagine could also be chained up into all sorts of interesting things. So cool, that's the Cosmics Pro. <laughs> Steady State Fate have the Steady State Gate. This is a take on a classic low pass gate with lots of extra bits of energy involved. This is a, an interesting looking module which just expands on the idea. So rather than, because the low pass gate tends to have a, you know, a filter inside that you can't really access. It's there just to provide you with that that natural organic feeling of a closing gate uh, as it gets triggered or excited or, or something. But with this one, Steady State Fate have opened it up to provide you with not just the low pass filter circuit, but also multiple modes of filtering inside. It also has some wave shaping or wave folding in there too to create different timbres and different ideas and different tones. This again is a sort of module that DivKid just completely nails uh, in a video. So if you want to understand what this is about, go and check out his video on it because uh, I don't have the skills with which to properly expand upon something quite so nuanced and interesting and novel as a steady state gate. Now at Synthfest France last year, Kadamo had a rather interesting looking synthesizer. It was called the Infini FM and Formant Synthesizer and had this strange form of synthesis called bit masking, which kind of produces this raggedy, jaggedy edge 
chiptune-esque, I suppose, kind of uh, waveform and sound source. Now, they seem to have taken that idea and stuffed it into a new synthesizer called the Mask 1. Now, I mean, that's fine. The sound engine is awesome. It's just that the difference between the two synths in terms of looks is quite staggering. I mean, the new one, the Mask 1, looks a bit like an like kind of one of those old Akai um, synthesizers with with kind of nothing going on on the front panel, just this very dull medical cream kind of colour and a few buttons. And that just seems like a bit of a step down from what they were doing with the Infini just the year before. We don't know a whole lot about it so far. It's got a couple of oscillators and apparently there are about 200 bit masked waveforms. They've also got a noise generator and a digital 12 state variable filter. There's a whole stack of LFOs and seven envelopes apparently and it also has this interesting ability to let you kind of morph between chords so it slides or slurs from one chord to another. I think it probably needs a little bit more explanation so we'll see what happens with that. The Enima Omega. Omega, perhaps. This is a new polyphonic physical modeling synthesizer. So we're talking uh, strings and pipes and clangs and skins and resonators and other bits and pieces that create, that use a computer and use intelligence to create sounds based on physical objects. So that makes sense. Did, did I explain that correctly? And Aodio originally came to market with the, the monophonic. Anima Fee, which they stuck on a Kickstarter. It was, a, it was a not in a particularly attractive box, but it was apparently very, very good at producing those acoustically modelled sounds. And so with this new, with this new endeavour, they've, they've taken on board the fact that the box itself wasn't very, wasn't particularly friendly. And so they've pulled it out, expanded it into a proper synthesizer side of things, really radically improved the interface and given you a lot more expressive control, which is really what you want. Because if you're talking about physical modeling, you're talking about trying to play a string properly, or you're trying to imitate pipes or flutes uh, or any sort of, real acoustic instrument and within that you need the ability to be able to perform it and that I think is what they're bringing together uh, with the Omega. So people are very much into it, it's on Kickstarter, it's already funded, it's got 16 voices, it's got a ribbon controller uh, and it's got this tappy sort of sort of like a like a laptop control pad, track pad type XY pad uh, but you can tap on it in order to to generate those sorts of strikes and hits and, uh, and other bits of expressive information and data that you want to send into the sound engine. Somewhere within all of this is a, an enormous amount of complexity. It's like the sound engine is a modular synthesizer all by itself, and you've got this screen into which you can patch and rearrange the architecture to, to work however you want it to. It's very interesting. It's also remarkably affordable. I mean, the keyboard version is just a little bit under £900, which just doesn't seem bad at all for quite a chunky, interesting polyphonic synthesizer. Now, as you know, from my whole molten motion meter thing, I'm a big fan of visualising voltages. And that is something that's, that's not exactly new, because people have been doing this with patch cables for a little while. This is one from Producer Tools uh, that I quite like. Can you see that light lighting up? Can you see that lighting up? Yeah, just about it does. But anyway, my volts, who who produce all sorts of different cables and bits of power and, and interesting bits and pieces, got together with Andrew Wang and decided to do something slightly better than this. And that are called, or they, are called Halo. <laughs> Which is that? Can, can, you, can you see that? I don't know. Yes, you can. Maybe you can. Maybe you can't. I don't know. But the idea is that rather than having this kind of transparent big patch thing on the end, uh, like this fella, uh, which, you know, which is all right, they've kind of made it slightly more elegant. And so this is, uh, you know, is not transparent, as you can see. And so that produces this halo. They're called halo cables. This halo at this end, but also at the back end as well. So when it's patched into something, you can see it here as well as seeing it kind of reflected in the front panel of the patch socket itself. It's good, it's neat. It's very neat and very elegant. I like that a lot. And they come in all sorts of different lengths and colors <laughs> and things. I've got another one here. 
Uh, there's both sort of blues and greens. <laughs> and stuff. I'll do a proper video on them soon because they sent me a pack to see what I think because they like my uh, molten motion meter of course and I, I do mean to get to reciprocate and send them one as well. But what are they? They're just trying to visualize voltage. You've got voltage going through here. So I've got LFOs going through here and you can see the positive and negative um, voltage as it goes through. It goes green and red or it goes blue and red I think it is are the, are the two options on these really nice high quality cables that are going to uh, plug around all sorts of places. They say that there's bugger all voltage drop when you're using it. You know, there's a there's a tiny bit. So if you're if you do mul if you do lots of stuff after the decimal point in levels of precision, then perhaps they're not for you. But if you're just doing normal stuff like the majority of us, then you're not going to notice any any particular problems or drops in voltage, at least as far as I've found out so far and really I've just only plugged them in. But they're fun and fruity and, and who doesn't want more lights in their modular? Audio Modern make some really nice, chunky, interesting, creative plugins. And one of the latest ones is called Loop Mix, which kind of does what it says. Get a bunch of loops, throw them together, and it resequences them for you. Slices them up, uh, reorders, and intelligently produces beats and interesting bits and pieces right within your door. So you can load up to six sequencer channels. You can stuff in a whole bunch of loops and it will, in, as I say, intelligently slice them up and rearrange them for you. It could be a great way of processing vocals. could be a great way of creating drum patterns from a number of other loops. And it's a sort of software that's really good at probability and randomization and creating variation along the way. So if you're bored of your drum loops or looking for a little bit of inspiration, then I think the loop mix could be of a real benefit to you. In 2014, Waldorf introduced us to this strike effect little box, a little box that was full of string synths. People are fascinated with string synths. Me, not really. Not really fascinated with string synths. I find that's the preset I don't really want to use or anything else. But I understand that uh, these are things that people like, and so I know that's a good thing. So anyway, so Waldorf introduced this string synth back from pulled out of the dark ages and boom there you go nice piece of hardware great everybody liked it the sort of people who like those sort of things sort of liked it which is great <laughs> anyway they've now produced a plug-in version is it called the same thing yeah it's called the same thing it's a strike fet string plug-in vsdi plug-in for your door software instrument it's got a similar sort of interface which is nice actually you know, the, the hardware was quite uh, sort of a squat, square little box with just what you needed on it in order to produce the sounds that you were after, and the software does exactly the same. Just a little bit more animated, a little bit more colourful. It's uh, fully polyphonic, you can split it about your keyboard, and of course it doesn't really sound like anything like it's supposed to sound like the things it's supposed to sound like, because this is, this is ancient and awesome uh, string simulation technology, which, you know, it's, is it, does it sound like a violin? No, not really. But we love it, apparently. Yes, we do. Moog have released the Mini Moog Model D. Oh yes, not a Model E. No, I don't think we're ever going to see one of those. This is the Model D yet again, once more. Once more, here we go. They did this a little while ago, and they built uh, a whole bunch, I think, and then ran out of components and went, there you go, there you go, that's a reissue of the Model D, people have been asking us for it for, for 400 years, and we finally did it, and there you go, and people lapped it up. In fact, apparently Moog were quite surprised at the enthusiasm for their little synth. I mean, don't they ever go on any forums or listen to anybody at all? Anyway, they found a few more components down the back of the sofa, and they thought, well, we could put some more together then. So they have, but this time, they've decided to add about $2,000 to the price. Well, you would, wouldn't you? I mean, if, you, if you're producing something that everybody loves and you've got absolutely no problem in, in thinking you're going to sell a whole shed load of them, then, you know, slap thousands on it. Yeah, why not? Why not have a bit of that action? I mean, it's not as if someone else is going to produce the exact same synthesizer for, for a couple of hundred quid now, is it? No, it's not. I don't know what to do with it. I mean, it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. I love what they've done with the wood, the slightly darker stain. I think it's gorgeous. Of course it's a gorgeous instrument. I mean, I think the point with the Model D is that it is an instrument. It's It doesn't really matter what it sounds like. 
because it, we know it's going to sound awesome because it's hand built in mostly in the Moog factory. So we don't have any doubt about what it will sound like. And of course we have plugins that sound just like it or we have a couple of hundred quids worth of something or other which sounds just like it. But that's not important. I think if that's what your focus is then you've missed the point of what a Model D ultimately is. And it's, it's a piece of history, it's a vintage piece of music technology furniture, it's a piece of art, it's an acoustic electric sculpture of an instrument is what it is so you can't really see it in the same terms if you just want the sound then go and get yourself a plug-in that, that's that's not what it's about but if you want to enjoy the experience of sitting in a room in a space and interacting with a particularly awesome historical instrument then the model d is for you you know if you have if you have five grand to put down on one see we're now all wishing we bought one the last time they came out when they were three grand you know <laughs> <laughs> or of course you can still pick up an original for many many tens of thousands of dollars i'm sure so a fabulous thing it's, it's lovely to see it looks absolutely gorgeous meanwhile sequential have produced another synthesizer yes they have it looks a lot like a lot of their other synthesizers i wonder whether there's really more room for more sequential synthesizers i guess there probably is i mean yeah, everybody loves sequential i do absolutely uh, adore what they do but I, i'm just trying to to decide whether there's there's room whether there's gap in between their product line which seems pretty comprehensive to find yet another space for another very very similar but somehow a little bit different synthesizer I think the idea is that this one is three oscillators, which is a little bit different from, from most of the stuff that they do, other than the Pro 3, but then this is polyphonic. So maybe it came from the idea of the, the super fat Pro 3 that they did. Let's pull, let's pull that out and expand it into a polyphonic synthesizer. Maybe that's, that's the idea. Or it seems to be along the lines of a three oscillator Prophet 6, something like that. I mean, it, it looks great. It looks great, it will sound great it has all the bits that you need it's also the last synthesizer that Dave Smith actually personally worked on so it has that legacy as well and is perhaps the last synthesizer before sequential moves forward into finding its own renewed path we shall see but is it different enough or interesting enough to to take you away from the the, the Prophet 5 or the Prophet 6 or the Prophet 12 or the Rev 2 or the numerous, the Take 5, or the numerous other <laughs> synthesizers of similar size and shape and functionality that Sequential already do. ALM, or is it Busy Circuits? I don't know, they've upgraded PAMs. We now have Pamela's Pro workout. What's better? I don't know, I never, didn't know what was in the first one, really. It was one of those mysterious modules that had loads and loads of functions and and bits in it and a, a tiny little screen with, with nothing going on and people say oh yeah well you should have one definitely and I go well, I don't understand why 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 what is it and do it's a clock oh great oh, I've got clocks no no but it's it's a clock right. right so anyway they've come out with a pro and I thought right well everyone says I should have one so I should have one so I got one yeah what does it do I don't know I haven't plugged it in yet but I plan to I'd like to <laughs> my understanding is that you've got eight outputs that can be any kind of clocky type thing so you can have a you know a steady pulse you can have a shuffle pulse you can have uh, euclidean rhythms you can have pattern sequences you could have all sorts of uh, arpeggiations and envelopes even and modulation and stuff coming out of this and the point of the pro version is that you have this much larger full color screen so you can see what's going on it'll also show you the modulation that's coming out which is interesting it's got a big yellow button that starts everything off and a, and a bit of a knob and apparently this interface is more than enough to get everything you need possible coming out of here it's also got a few cv inputs that you can apply changes pattern changes other bits and pieces i imagine so i'm looking forward to getting into this in in some depth i think i mean everybody already knows all about it and i don't because i'm new to the party so i think it might be interesting to do a video of discovering what the heck this is about shall we do that let's do that soon sonicware have another liven box this one is the liven lo-fi 12. 
I've I've uh, reviewed both of the previous livens, the XFM one, is it called, and the Bass and Beats, I think. <laughs> two of them, anyway. Two of the previous ones I've reviewed for Sound on Sound, both of which just melted my brain. I mean, they absolutely have elements of, of fun and excitement and groove boxing in them, but they also have interfaces that just make you want to grind your teeth at times and snap it in half. They, they can be challenging, perhaps, but they're sticking with it. They're, you know, they're sticking with it. This is the interface that they like, or at least they maybe they bought like a hundred thousand of these boxes, and they're just going to have to try to keep putting things in them until they get through them all. But this one is a take on sampling on the sampler groove box. You could say an MPC, I suppose, although it, it doesn't have that interface. It has this strangely non-velocity sensitive button interface with a bunch of knobs that change their function depending on, I don't know, depending on on the weather, I think. But this is all about 12-bit sampling, trying to sound like an old Akai sampler, I think. Comes with a whole load of uh, presets and stuff put in, and those are always really good. I mean, you turn on one of these boxes and you hit play and just go, wow, this is amazing. It's the actual, then what do you do? Is the, <laughs> is the struggle, is the challenge. So I can play with this bit all day, I just have no idea how to create anything of my own. But apparently this is going to be much easier than the previous ones, for reasons that I, I don't know. But I guess if you're just dealing with, with samples, you're not trying to deal with complex synthesizer engines like you are with FM or Wavetable, maybe that's going to be the easier side of it. So are you going to be able to sample straight in, stick it on a, on a thing, sequence it and off you go? I don't know. But yes, as luck would have it, I will be reviewing one for Sound on Sound. So that will be along at some point, so I'm, I'm excited to see if I can get my teeth into it and to see whether it is easier to get into. Because there's there's a glorious beating heart of uh, yeah of fun and music making within these boxes. It's just sometimes it can feel like a real uphill struggle to get to that point. Jerry Audio has been releasing since like like they're going out of fashion. <laughs> It can't seem to help itself. Every week there's another Cherry Audio tease and there's another awesome take on an old crappy bit of uh, synthesizer history. Uh, this time it's the GX80, which is an amalgamation of the classic, iconic, legendary behemoth, which is the Yamaha CS80 and the GX1. GX1 was like, I mean, it's it's... It's a funny thing. I mean, I have lots of thoughts about uh, about the CS80 and also this synthesizer from Cherry Audio. I did a video on some presets, which I quite liked, and uh, that's out there. But if you want to know what I really think, you'll find it in my written review on the website. So go and check that out. But to, I guess, summarize that a little bit, is that I love the CS80, but I don't love it as an instrument. I think it's an ugly, unwieldy, weird-looking <laughs> piece of equipment. Uh, it's not that that I that I love. I mean, it's 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 come or evolved out of the idea of organs, which is where the GX1 definitely comes from, with multiple layers of stuff and the, the sort of the buttons and the sort of controls that it has, and also the sound engine. While being synthesis and analog synthesis is coming from the direction of organs, and that gives it that gives it its unique sound, but also makes it mostly a bit naff, at least to my ears sorry and all that but those tones that you get on the buttons on the front which are kind of like it's preset engine <laughs> before you get into the sound design they're just so old school ropey it's just not funny so what it is that i love about the cs80 because it is absolutely one of the most awesome synthesizers ever created is the way that people are able to get extraordinary sounds out of it and it's almost like despite the interface despite the synthesizer you know, Vangelis was able to tease out these amazingly uh, emotive and evocative and heart-pulling sounds. And that's all there within the Cherry Audio plugin. It absolutely is. I mean, the interface is still weird. I mean, what Black Corporation did really well with the Deckard's Dream is to distill that interface down to something which is more logical and makes more sense and is more approachable while retaining much or all of that character and that soul. But the original CS80 and the GX1, they're just, in some ways, incomprehensible, unwieldy, odd things with weird controls. 
they have this strange envelope thing going on, this initial level and this attack level, which is, it just feels unnecessary. But at the same time, of course, it's all part of what makes it its thing. The other thing is that these synthesizers had paddles. Now, paddles, uh, paddle. I mean, rather than having a knob that you turn or sliding push up and down, it's sort of had this paddle idea. And with, with those, what it enabled you to do when you're playing the instrument is kind of nudge stuff. So as you're playing, you can nudge these paddles and that would make tonal changes. Now all of that is completely lost in software, but the paddles are still there. So those paddles are one of the things that made the CS80 very, very much a unique instrument because of the way that you play it, along with the ribbon on the front, gives this expressive idea that nothing else kind of really had, I don't think at the time. So, I mean, it continues just to be really, really interesting. And coming back to the GX80, the Cherry Audio emulation, it is superb. There's some fantastic sounds in there. There's some naffy crap sounds too, but I mean, wow, it can make some stuff that's, that's instantly, it resonates with you in a, in a 70s, in a vintage way, because it has this edge, it walks this edge between naffness and extraordinariness. Somehow it manages to pull fantastical sounds out of out of that environment out of that um that paradox that that dialectic interference of uh cosmic radiators i don't know it's great anyway you should go and check it out and the great thing about cherry audio synths is that they're dead cheap the pandora from expert sleepers is I don't think the name is, is the perfect fit for it because you automatically go to Pandora's box and you automatically go to it's full of all sorts of crazy things, which it, it's full of a lot of interesting stuff. It's just not quite, not quite a Pandora. But, but put that to one side for the moment. Pandora, what it is, is a really solid and interesting uh, vectoral based bandpass filter with MOSFET distortion. So it's the sort of thing that can warm and saturate and make... Uh, lovely things while shifting a kind of a high pass low pass band pass thing around uh, in order to create uh, to rhythms and sweeps uh, to cut things out to bring things in so you know numerous interesting possibilities within a relatively simple looking module again div has got in there and just blown our minds with the sort of things you can do with it it's it's extraordinary how he does that <laughs> absolutely extraordinary but ultimately what you get with Pandora is this gooey sounding, soft and saturated analog module that through through some careful modulation, you can come up with endless possibilities of shifting timbres and warmth and throbbiness. The Cairn from Instruo is, is a great looking four channel module. It's quite obviously four channels. You can see it's four sliders. It must be four channel something. What do we think, mixing? VCA. It looks a bit like a Veils. I've got a Veils up there. Oh, and here I've got two of them. Uh, sliders, VCAs, and yes, yes it does that. But this is kind of like a mixer module that has superpowers. Because it has four channels, but each of those channels can also do something else. So while you can stuff CV into it and mix out a modulated output, or you can stuff audio in it and come out with a mix output of that, you can also do interesting things with each channel individually. So channel one, for instance, has voltage controlled panning. Channel two is more of a traditional VCA with just CV control over the level. Channel three has a switch which turns it into an attenuverter, which also somehow through the magic of modular be makes it a ring modulator. And channel four has an extra input to provide you with a crossfade. So what you have as a utility mixer suddenly it becomes a utility all sorts of things, including a stereo. VCA because of the I guess because of the panning and the and the other bits and pieces but you can also through the magic of the back patching there's a back patching socket you can connect more of these up to produce 8 12 16 as many as you like potentially a uh, mixing console you could have a whole row of these things going on kind of cascading into each other but what is always there is just the elegance and beauty of these instruo modules i mean it's interesting listening to, to Jason talk about them in the video because he says that mixing was something he always used to do outside of his rack. You know, he'd take various feeds out and then mix somewhere else. Whereas bringing these in, he's found that they weren't planning on making a mixer. It's just kind of what it turned into. 
and he's found them to be completely fascinating and useful and has brought everything back into his rack again so he can now uh, mix and affect and modulate that mix within his larger patch and it's really interesting to to watch a designer and a module manufacturer get enthusiastic and fascinated by their own creations and i think that's i think that's really interesting and it looks like a really good way to expand a system as you gradually build up add another module and cascade them from one to another yeah interesting stuff cork has updated its collection to collection four now these are probably some of the oldest software synthesizers out there the original collection was from decades ago and had like the m1 and the poly 6 and the ms20 and things like that inside it and it was fantastic i used it in a gig about 12 years ago it's for my 40th birthday uh, i did a gig uh, the band we did all 80s numbers and I did the whole Depeche Mode and and Aha and all those sorts of things using the the Korg collection which was installed on a to on a tiny little notepad notepad little clamshell laptop notepad thing which I've still got over there somewhere and you had to overclock the processor just to get it to run it without clicking you know flying on the edge we were so I used all these synths you know just with a MIDI controller and play guitar and sang and, and that kind of stuff. And it was fantastic. And they've always been fantastic. They completely nailed them right from the off, even though, as I say, this was a long, long time ago. So Korg have kept this going. They've gradually upgraded them, added in more things. You've, you had uh, I, things I can't remember in, came in relatively recently. But anyway, there's a new version, version four, to which they are adding the Electribe, the MicroCorg, and the Chaos Pad. Now, it's about time they put the Electribe in there, really, because that iPad app has been going again for a very, very long time. So it's good that the rest of us get to play with it on our desktops. The MicroCorg apparently is Korg's best-selling synthesizer ever. So we get a chance uh, to have a play on that in software. And the Chaos Pad, well, it's a bit of an effect thing, isn't it? It's kind of fun. It's going to work really well if you've got a touch screen, I imagine. The only downside, as it's always been, is they're just a bit pricey. It's a few hundred pounds, you know, several hundred pounds for this collection. And while it's, it's ultimately good value for what you get, it seems pricey compared to, to many other things that are available these days. Because you could kind of buy the hardware for the same sort of price. And that doesn't seem quite right. Apollo View, who I recently built this wonderful rabbit hole, this tube tube thing here, and I'm going to finish that off by building the, the rest of it, which is the curious part. This was the expander for it. It's a fabulous stereo, two channel, I can't quite remember, VCA um, mixer, and this adds further inputs to it to make it a four channel mixer. It has this wonderful tube in the middle, which just throbs and groans and growls and saturates. It's just heavenly. Anyway, they have a new module called the Oscillator. The, the Oscillator. The idea being that it has all the waveforms. It's an analog oscillator based on the same 3340 chip that uh, you know most oscillators use because that's the one. That's the one that's in the SH-101, the Prophet 5. It's the one that we love, that analog sound from that oscillator. But essentially it's a triangle core out of which people usually can pull a sawtooth and a pulse wave if they try hard enough. And that's what you tend to get. You tend to get those three waveforms, possibly a sub, if you if you want. What Apollo View have done is they've pulled out eight waveforms. Eight? I hear you say? That's crazy. No, how could it be possible? Well, no, they, they have through some clever using of wave shaping and pushing and pulling of axes about the place. That's what they've done. So what you get, apparently, here's a list. You get square sign, sign, triangle, sawtooth, pulse with pulse width modulation, shark tooth, and a pulse width modulated saw as as well. So you've got some, some shaky movie modulated stuff in there, a nice shark tooth, which Leo, which probably looks like you imagine it's gonna look like. Or would it be a shark fin? No, it's more triangular than that, I think. Oh, I don't know. So a whole bunch of waveforms, and all of them are available simultaneously, all at the same time, all coming out of all of these outputs that are all over the front panel of the thing. I mean, it looks great. It's got that red glow in there as well, which I think that is working really well for them. But it also looks quite uh, odd for an oscillator. It's not really what you expect. You've got a couple of smaller knobs in the middle and everything else is more or less outputs. 
But there's also more that you can do. You can bend it down so that it's a really stupidly slow LFO. Do like 15 minute cycles. <laughs> I mean, that's an entire set. You get to do one cycle, which I think is quite, quite awesome. There's also three different types of uh, sync, hard sync, hard sync with something else and some soft sync. We have negative or positive edges or, or something or other. And of course, there's the obligatory frequency modulation, either exponential or linear, I should think. Once again, our friend Divkid has done an awesome video on it showing that what the heck are you doing with all of that type of, of video where he gets out just extraordinary timbres, extraordinary sounds, mixes of waveforms. You know, I mean, it's the sort of thing that it could produce any kind of tone, any analog tone that you're after, really. And that could make it an extremely versatile oscillator to have in your rack. Probably need a good mixer with it. I'd recommend the Molten Motion Meter as a really good way of mixing three waveforms together to form interesting ideas. And finally, here's the latest information on Synthes. Synthes is a fabulous new synthesizer exhibition and performance event, which is taking place in Norwich next year on the 4th of March, 2023. It's a bit like a small synth fest or a larger modular meets. Somewhere between the two where manufacturers are going to gather in a nice big space at the Norwich Art Centre, going to be showing their stuff, letting you have hands on with all sorts of synths and modular. There'll also be synth clubs there. There'll be, there'll be EMOM there. There'll be representatives from, from magazines and interesting things. There'll be performances peppered throughout the day. Myself and Steve Davis are putting together a, a crazy kind of weird patch off with all sorts of YouTube and modular stars making an appearance to improvise together in extraordinary ways. In the evening there'll be performances again from myself and Steve but also from real proper performance type people doing proper performances. It's turning into a really a really exciting day and the day is going to be split we're going to have a, a daytime event where we have all the manufacturers and you can mill about and try all the gear and the performances within that and then the evening will be a separate thing because we're going to need to clear the halls so we can get everybody in and really really engage with the performances that are on offer so there's two things that are bundled together in a single awesome synth east day and you'll be able to buy tickets either for the day and the evening or both for a bundle discount Oh yes, tickets are going to be available in about two weeks. I will make a lot of noise when that happens, but we're thinking around something like the 9th of December, something like that. We should have everything together by. We're just still crossing a few T's and ticking a few I's just to make sure that we have everything in place and it's all going to just go off wonderfully. We did run into a little bit of trouble in our planning last month when we discovered that the date we had chosen was actually clashing with another proposed event which was going to happen in London. And I'd very much like to just say thank you to, to Paolo of the Synth and Pedal Expo for, for being gracious and uh, fabulous and being able to move the date of his event so that we were no longer clashing. We were already sort of barreling down towards uh, the 4th of March and so he was good enough to move uh, his date, for which I'm hugely uh, grateful for and that's been a great big sigh of relief. So now we are stuck with the 4th of March, we are heading for that time, it's a Saturday, it's going to be fantastic, it's going to be all day and into the evening, lots of exciting performances, lots of things to come, they will be an extraordinary raffle and I will be there hosting and going crazy on it. Electronic Sound Magazine are also supporting us and so are the Norwich Arts Centre. It's a fantastic collaborative event between myself, the Norwich Arts Centre and Electronic Sound Magazine and it's been it's been awesome putting this together and there's a heck of a load of work to do yet <laughs> but we will get there so I'll make sure that you're aware when tickets are available. If you're a, a manufacturer of synthesizers of modular or something like that then do go to the website there's a space there where you can apply for a table if you'd like to join us and uh, and show your stuff on the day that would be fantastic we're very much open to whoever wants to come all being well until we run out of space and of course I will keep you updated on every single development right that's it that'll do I think that's been a, a good session a lot of good stuff out uh, this month I think lots of interesting things for me I've got a whole bunch of interesting stuff to try as well that has been turning up over recent times and more stuff to come. So, you know, 
very exciting. I've done a good bit of DIY this month. I'm feeling good about that. A little bit more to do before um, I put that to one side for a bit longer. Of course, I'd like to do a little bit of Deckard's Dream because it is actually my birthday next next week. And so, as what happens on my birthday, I tend to try <laughs> to do a bit more of the Deckard's Dream. If no other time during the year I get a chance to do it, I, I attempt to do it on my birthday. However, my birthday's a Saturday this year, so who knows what's going to happen with that. But I would very much like to invite you to join me for a Sunday night live stream for a bit of a drink and a bit of a look through new things. So things like the Pams I've got. I've got the Modbat Trinity I'm reviewing. I've also got the Eventide Misha. That weird thing to have a look at amongst other bits and pieces. So we'll bring those together on Sunday night, have a bit of a play and see if we can make some music, drink some beers and have a thoroughly good time and celebrate the fact that I'm flipping 52. 52! What a load of nonsense is that? So there you are, lots more goodies to come. <laughs> Do go and check us out. Check out Synthes on the website. I'm also developing the Multi Music Technology website so that it has far more written reviews now and other bits and pieces. So do go and check that out too because you may find that I've written a review on something that you'd be quite interested in. And if you'd like to support the channel, then please you know, click on adverts and links and stuff. Use the affiliate links in the description of the videos because that helps me get a little kickback from whatever you buy from whatever store you want to go to. And if you want to get really hardcore, then come and join us on Patreon, where you can give me a couple of quid to support the videos that I make in this ongoing adventure into synthesis and modular and bits and pieces. Oh, and there was one more thing. And that is that I have a Surface Pro 9 has arrived. Surface Pro 9, yes. I'm still doing software and audio interfaces and stuff like that. I do, I know I give the impression I'm now strictly modular, it's simply not the case. It's just purely prioritizing and finding the time to do the things I need to do. So I do have a Surface Pro 9 and I have begun testing on it and it's, it's doing all right so far and I will produce a proper video showing you exactly what that's all about sometime soon. So I think that's everything. And in the meantime, go and make some tunes. Mm -hmm.